I just had a case recently. Young young woman passed away, but dad had 50-50 custody. So then it was a bit of a fight because grandparents wanted their visitation. And in family court, um, grandparents can bring an action for grandparents' rights. Mm -hmm. Um, but in your experience, does that now go to the probate court or so will they kick it back to family court? It, it, it's up to the judge. Um, so if there is already, what I usually see is if there is already a pre-existing um, case, then family court retains jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, but where there, there hasn't been, um, let's say, a divorce proceeding, a custody battle, but there's been a death in the pat, um, family, then usually, so there's this pre-existing order, but there's nothing pending, no mm -hmm. impending proceeding, then that's where um, you do come into the probate court and you seek a guardianship order, whether it's guardianship um, over this. Now we're talking about guardianship over the person. person. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's where you seek an order of visitation of some sort, um, depending mm -hmm. on what happened in the family law court, because if there's been some kind of, not the 50-50, but if there's been some sort of uh, determination that they're an unfit parent, mm -hmm. Um, then there would need to be some kind of guardianship action that takes place. How does the probate court view grandparents? Is there's a high? I know parents have parent, mm -hmm. you know, rights, but after that, are grandparents favored? Are siblings favored? Kind of what is the hierarchy in terms of who gets appointed as the concern as the guardian? guardian. Or, mm -hmm. um, the hierarchy is is parents. Um, then siblings, uh, but it is absolutely to the court's discretion. Mm -hmm. um, it, it depends on the re generally the relationship, the, the time spent, the nature of, um, because it, even if it's a grandparent, but the child never met this grandparent, but they've been in the, the um, quote-unquote custody of, let's say, a sibling or a niece or nephew, then that person, the court's going to look at, give them more weight depending on their relationship with the child. There's a lot. There's a lot more gray area. So much <laughs> than I actually anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we kind of touched on this. But in the preparation of a trust, mm -hmm. can it cover a lot of these issues that we're talking about? So the the trust is going to absolutely cover, um, in especially when it comes to um, guardianships and children, uh, because in the trust, now you don't have to come into court if there is a trust that's been established to have a guardian of the estate appointed because, as we discussed, now you have already made a determination. And the same is true um, just with respect to if you don't have a trust, if you have estate planning documents where you've made a nomination mm -hmm. for who should serve as the guardian, then... Um, that too is is extremely extremely helpful. I would just say it's it's essential to have that appointed because otherwise now you have people battling it out in court and um, ultimately those fees and costs are going to chip away at what, what you intend the child or what you would desire the child to um, ultimately inherit. So definitely with when it comes to the children, um, you you definitely want to have an estate plan. You brought up an important issue, how much would something like that cost if people are fighting and that comes out of the estate, right? It can ultimately come out of the estate. So usually in the beginning, you're having to, to advance your own funds. Um, but in the event or upon appointment, then you can petition the court to have the guardianship pay those costs because ultimately um, it is necessary and in the best interest of the child for there to be a guardian. And if you had to, to duke it out about who's going to be that guardian, then the court can certainly order, um, order the guardianship, depending on the nature of that guardianship as well, uh, to pay those costs. So those costs can be, huh, I mean, they, it could just be in, in the thousands of dollars, I, uh, because at the point where you have a contested matter, as, as it is with just all matters, you're, you're in the upwards of tens of thousands of dollars as soon as a matter is contested and you're in and out of court and um, filings upon filings and services are rendered and, and costs to file and various other costs are being incurred. So it's an extremely costly um, um, proceeding that isn't necessary 
necessary if you have an estate plan most often. This sounds like the conversation I often have about prenup, right? Because prenups aren't to discuss the end of your marriage or the end of your relationship or say you don't trust one another. It's a way to understand the business of the relationship. And I think a trust is very similar to that. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that today um, to address a lot of these issues. So when do you recommend that someone comes to see you if they have a joint trust with their spouse? Do they have to dissolve that trust if they want to start a new trust? How does that work? So if they're going to go through the divorce proceeding, mm-hmm. and so I have to understand more about the stay. I hope we haven't. So <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we need to talk more. But um, so back to to there being this stay, but I would uh, I would venture to say that as as long as the two of them are in agreement mm-hmm. on how things should should be um, disposed, I would think that they can agree beyond that stay it would have to be in writing because they're not they're not supposed to touch the trust um property or whatever's in the trust Hmm. um but at some point i suspect they need to dissolve a joint trust if they want to do their individual trust how does that work well it would be perfectly fine after the stay is no longer in place so if that that stay has now been lifted or the divorce is now um finalized and depending on what the divorce judgment um, specifies and confirms as to who gets what assets then you you just automatically create your own plans Mm -hmm. you would create your own plans do you have to dissolve the the joint trust or can you just create another one that supersedes that joint trust So my understanding is that a dissolution judgment is going to automatically revoke the designations um, in a pre-existing trust. So if if it's automatically revoked, then to answer your question, it's sort of an automatic, but you're going to still, um, you're going to reinforce that in your new agreement. So that joint trust by operation of law, I would say, as to that, that former spouse, um, those terms as to that former spouse are now revoked. And so you would just need to do an entirely new plan that says I revoke all former um, pre-existing documents and I'm going to do this new plan. So I'm assuming that you're assuming that all of the trust property is divided in the dissolution. Yeah, that, that, that's, um, that's usually the case. Um, I know that I've heard before that things could be left out, but mm-hmm. but yeah. um, and as for those things that are left out, then um, in the trust there is normally a residuary clause mm-hmm. that ultimately, de- depending on if it's separate or community property, then that can be um, designated to certain beneficiaries as well. So um, you would need to do that mm-hmm. in the trust. I hope that answers your... It does. It does. And it is so much crossover. I think it is very, very important while you're going through a divorce to also talk to a trust attorney so you know what that turnover process is like, especially if there is any concerns from you or the other spouse potentially being incapacitated, definitely should talk to a trust attorney. Um, I think we talked about a lot of this already, but what tips would you give to people to avoid a lot of what we're talking about? Well, you said it. Um, everything is is about pre-planning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm sure you could speak to the, the prenuptial and I can speak to the, the estate planning. Um, you want to establish who your agents are in the event of your incapacity, um, your your health care. You certainly don't want um, the person that you're seeking to separate or divorce <laughs> to make decisions for you. Right. Um, and so you, you definitely want to, to establish these plans. Um, it's going to alleviate a lot of heartache and, and finances and delay um, with respect to people having to go through extra unnecessary steps to to get things in line in order that you could have done um, previously. And when we say trust, we're talking about your health care directives. We're talking about power of attorney. We're talking about access to your bank accounts because I've seen a lot of people mm-hmm. have issues with getting 
access to bank accounts because there's no directive anywhere um, letting the bank know how that happens. Mm -hmm. So this all goes back to what I always say. A lot of this is about planning. Some of it might never happen, but at least you can sleep well at night knowing that if it does happen, your kids are taken care of, your ex doesn't get all your property, and um, your family's not in one of our offices. <laughs> but like I say, you don't want us, the attorneys, right. to become your heirs. Right. <laughs> That's what ultimately <laughs> happens. And so. that is what happens. Because mm -hmm. people, can, like you said, can spend thousands and thousands of dollars between the family court and the probate court, mm -hmm. and then there's no estate. That's and um, it all could have been avoided with a trust That's right. and a prenup. That's, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So as we conclude, I wanted to, we are concluding because I can talk to Tatiana mm -hmm. all day long. But I, more often. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much for taking your time to come and sit with me. And for all of you listening, thank you so much. I hope you learned a lot. I know I did. And until next time, I am Demetria Graves.